In DC, for DC. DC Radio, 96.3 HD4 and DCRadio.gov. You've attended council hearings in person. You've tuned in to our televised proceedings on Channel 13. Now, you have the chance to listen to us on the radio as we demystify the work of the people who do it. This is not a council hearing. This is Hearing the Council with your host, Josh Gibson. Thank you, deep voice person with a funky backbeat. Indeed, this is not a council hearing. This is Hearing the Council. You can't have a government without a council, so you can't have a government radio station without a council show. This is it. We are not coming to you from the train track and closed nerve center like we normally do. We're coming to you from my home and the council members. Never expected to say that. I'm Josh Gibson, Director of Communications for the Council. You may also know me as the Council's voice on social media at Council of DC. Uh, This is a special round of hearing council interview, uh, uh, council interviews listeners, uh, one we never expected to have to do. And we're hoping we don't need to do it again. Um, this is a special home edition of Here in the Council. Um, and without any further ado, let me um, introduce Ward 3 Councilmember Mary Che. Thank you so much for joining us, Councilmember Che. Absolutely my pleasure. Uh, now, this, I think, is going to be a, a fun interview uh, because I don't know if people remember the uh, uh, sort of fun power game that people could play called The Six Degrees of Kevin Bacon, where Every they figured out every actor was six degrees removed from this one actor, Kevin Bacon. This interview is one degree of Mary Che because there are a number of topics in the news, national and international news, that are just one degree removed from Councilmember Che. We're going to focus on a number of those today. Uh, the first of those is related to the COVID pandemic. And the news came out a couple of weeks ago that you are actually participating in a vaccine trial. Uh, why don't you tell us a little bit about how that came to be and uh, how you're dealing with that? Well, uh, as you know, the council has done lots of things connected with the uh, public health emergency. A lot of bills about evictions and shut off of electrical service. It's many, many things. But, you know, I... Um, I had an opportunity through uh, doctor friends uh, to become aware of the uh, vaccine trials. And I just decided that even though it's a really small thing, it was something that I could personally do, I think, to help uh, get us out of this mess. I mean, we're in a great big mess and um, I think a vaccine uh, is a key way for us to get out of it. And so um, one of my uh, physician friends said, well, uh, the others have already signed up. I haven't signed up. Why don't we sign up and do it together? And that that made it uh, even more uh, acceptable to me that I was going to go with a friend, you know, so that we do it together. And so we signed up. And the one we signed up with was uh, the Moderna uh, NIH uh, test. So these uh, different groups are testing slightly different things. And I like the idea about how they're going about this one, but I did it because I wanted to, you know, make a small contribution, but also to see how these trials were being conducted. I want to be able to say, and I can say, uh, certainly so far, that I have confidence in how they're, how they're handling things. Um, I did have a bit of a rough time with my (laughs) vaccinations. Um, There are two. Uh, You go in, you sign all this paperwork, you have a physical exam. They do a really, really painful, super duper COVID test on you. They take tons of blood, but then at some point you get the the vaccination and um, 50% of the people are uh, placebos and 50% are getting the actual um, the actual drug. And so, uh, I didn't know, and we got, both of us got this about noon and then we were, you know, texting back and forth. We went home after stopping and having a wonderful lunch, (laughs) um, and nothing was happening. So we figured, oh, darn, we got the placebo. But then the next day, wow. (laughs) I mean, headache, muscle aches, joint aches, supreme tiredness. I mean, it was, it was very awful, I have to say. So I said to my friend, again, she's a doctor, 
And I said, well, might this not be the same effect from if we got the placebo? She said, Mary, you don't have a reaction like this from a saline shot. So, um, and then I had the rea same reaction uh, the second time too. Um, you go for, you, you get two, two injections and then um, there's a lot of stuff that you have to do along the way. You have to, you know, take your temperature, you have to electronically report on any changes, you know, or things that you're experiencing. They call you twice a, a month. Uh, and we're going back next Friday again, not for any more injections. We had the two of those, but for lots more blood draws. And um, the whole process, the whole test should take actually about two years. They're going to follow people for two years. Um, hopefully, the vaccine, this one or one of the others, will be uh, sufficiently um, effic efficacious and uh, uh, otherwise successful that we'll have it sooner for administration. But the whole test, you know, from start to finish should be, should be two years. So that's it. And, um, and is, the, is the Moderna, was, was that one? I don't think that was one of the ones that they had to pause. No, happened. no, no, that wasn't, that wasn't one of them. And, and now there's another one where they're pausing a little bit, but this, but this one hasn't been. Um, but you don't know. I mean, if you have a really adverse reaction that someone has, there may be some underlying uh, conditions that they didn't know about or, or something. Uh, but I think so far, I, this one hasn't had any any issues. This one is based on a, on a different kind of theory. You know, like for um, polio, you actually get the virus, but it's dead. And they inject it in you and your immunological system recognizes it and is poised, you know, in case the real thing comes along. This doesn't rely on the virus itself being dead. It relies on the fact that apparently there's a protein that surrounds the virus. And this is based upon getting your immune system keyed up to act against the protein and thereby kill the virus. Uh, and it's also a good thing that they have these different methodologies because one or the other might work better. So it's good that they have this, you know, these points of comparison. Anyway. Um, where, where, where are you left if you pretend another vaccine ends up getting selected as the primary vaccine in America? Will you then receive that vaccine, or is the assumption that, that well, this one? Uh, yeah, that, that's a really good question. Uh, you know, whether you can accept, you know, another vaccine, I, I would assume that you can. And if it were cleared, I would, uh, although I've already been vaccinated, so to speak. But uh, I would hope that they continue through with this trial because it has a different methodology related to it which might be helpful in some other context as well. So I, I would hope that they would follow through on it. Nevertheless, I don't know. I don't know what the terms of the agreement are, um, you know, with the pharmaceutical companies, with the government, et cetera. Have you or your doctor friend heard one way or the other, if your reaction to presuming that to other folks that got the non placebo mm -hmm. is your reaction kind of standard or did you have a particularly strong reaction? No, they haven't told us. They don't tell you anything. They don't want anybody to know anything about particular patients. Uh, they don't want, we're even going to have to pretend, you know, like a veil of secrecy about what our reactions were, because then it would be known that I got the vaccine and it wasn't a placebo. Not even the staff people know who gets the vaccine and who doesn't get the vaccine. But, you know, I've had, um, I've had flu shots sometimes, uh, and uh, I've had uh, shot for uh, pneumonia, for shingles, um, and almost invariably I get, you know, a, a kind of a <laughs> vigorous reaction. Now with the, with the shingles and the, and the um, pneumonia shots, those are also two. I, my experience with those was the first one, whoa, that was, ooh. and the second one, you know, which I dreaded, not so much. And I had hoped that this would be the same way. But this one, the second one, not as bad, but still, you know, um, a tough day and a half uh, of recovery. But, you know, um, as I said, I just, it's minor. I, I'm, I can see that it's just like one little drop in the bucket, but I felt like it was public spirited to do this. And so, so I did it. 
I did it. Uh, now, a lot of people are talking about the uh, possibility of there being an October surprise of uh, vaccine approval or announcement um, prior to the election. Uh, what will it take for you to feel comfortable to recommend to Ward 3 residents to get a vaccine? Well, you know, uh, I have a sign out on my front lawn that says, thank you, Dr. Fauci. You have the same sign. In my yes, mind. yes, because I want to rely on people who are not manipulated by the president, who are not acting politically. Uh, his personal doctor, if he said this was okay to take a vaccine, I would run away from it. I mean, the man has shown no commitment to either completeness or full, you know, to truth. So, but if Dr. Fauci said, you know, that it was okay, then then I would take it. But I, I don't believe, given the, even the rigor uh, and the commitment to doing this as quickly as possible, that it would be possible in the next le less than three weeks to have a vaccine uh, available. And even if it were, they're not going to have the infrastructure to have it distributed. So um, Mr. Trump can say whatever he wants, but it really seems that if you listen to the scientists, the real scientists, the honest scientists, that looks like um, it's not going to happen. Okay, now uh, we're, we're, we're definitely not trying to be political. This isn't a political show, but it just happens that you are tied into these two uh, national news stories. Uh, the other one is the recent passing of Ruth Bader Ginsburg. Um, and uh, we had, uh, uh, if you could quickly tell that story about how you are just one degree of separation and how she actually played a role in your uh, arrival on the political scene in D.C.? Well, first let me back up and say, uh, because I'm a law professor and I teach constitutional law and I teach criminal procedure, almost every day I'm encountering one of her opinions, which reminds me of how much this country is going to miss her voice. Um, and not just, you know, equal protection and, and women's rights, but other uh, liberties that we enjoy, for example, in criminal procedure, I invariably come up against this case or that case where her opinion, either separate opinion or for the court, really um, is compelling. And um, it, it's, uh, it's a big gap uh, for the court uh, to fill. Uh, and I don't know that uh, the nominee will do that. But how do I know her? Well, I knew her uh, from before she was on the Supreme Court, uh, because we served on some committees together uh, when she was on the Court of Appeals for the, for the District of Columbia. The, um, and so we knew each other. And then uh, once, um, actually, I was really, to talk, I guess some people are like taken by uh, rock stars or other prominent people, but, uh, you know, and if they, if they should sign, you know, sign something for you, autograph something, and you're kind of over the top sports figures. Well, um, she apparently uh, must have read, who, who does this anyway, must have read some of my law review articles, if you can believe that. Nobody reads law review articles, except like five other people in your field. Um, I mean, that's not entirely true, but largely true. And one day I got a note, I was uh, sitting in my office and I got a note from her that she had read one of them and she had these like very favorable things to say. And I was, whoa, look at that. Talk about validation. Um, in any case, so we had these contacts and, you know, she, uh, uh, she would be at, you know, different uh, events or whatever that I would also be at. I mean, we weren't, uh, you know, um, we, we were just casual friends and professional uh, friends. And um, so when I was elected, which is the story that I guess you want to get to, when I was elected for the first time, this was in 2000, uh, the election was in 2006 and the swearing in was in 2007. Apparently, and who knew this? I didn't know anything about it. I didn't even know, you know, where the precincts were in my ward or anything. Um, so I found out, I was told by the secretary to the council that 
you had to you had to go get your own judge to swear you in. You know, they didn't supply a judge. You had to get a judge. I said, we have to get a judge? Okay. So I figured, hey, maybe I'll ask Justice Ginsburg if she would do it. So I, I dropped her a little note, and she said, certainly. I'm happy to do it. And so I was, again, over the top happy. And uh, I don't know. You must have seen these things, how they go forward, you know, the big swearing-in ceremonies. What happens is they call you up with your judge, right? And usually, almost always, usually the judge will say, uh, you know, raise your right hand and put your hand on the Bible and ad administer the oath. That's the judge's job or the justice's job. Not much more than that. And by the way, I heard from someone in my office that you were able to get the clip of this. Um, so thank you very much, because I, you know, I didn't have it or anything. Um, in any case, so they call up Ward 3, me, and my judge, my justice. And we're way on the end. And as we get up to walk to the podium, you know, uh, Justice Ginsburg was sort of slight, and she was very soft-spoken. And she said to me on the way walking to the podium, she said, Mary, do you mind if I say a few words about you? I said, Justice Ginsburg, you can do whatever you want. You can filibuster, you can, I didn't say all that. I just said, certainly, certainly that would be, that would be wonderful. And whereupon she made up some nice stuff about me. Um, and yeah. I it's funny because I, I mean, I know for a fact, obviously, those, uh, at least going back uh, several administrations, those are could be of taped and are televised on Channel 13 and Channel 16. And because I do a radio show with the Office of Cable Television, uh, I was thinking I should be able to get this video. But I had kind of mixed feelings because, you know, in your memory and nostalgia sometimes you build things up or you you know you you sort of uh you add a little flavor to your memory and i was afraid that you had this impeccable flawless gorgeous memory and obviously she did speak You're, that's not something you would have changed right, right. Your memory but i was like oh geez what if she watches it and it's not as great as she remembered but then i got the video i watched the video and i said this is totally consistent with a couple of times I've heard you uh, tell the story, and it was very positive and complimentary. So I kind of crossed my fingers and said, I think she's going to be yeah. happy. Well, you know what? The other thing, I listened to it, and I said, huh. You know, I said this to someone in my office. I said, I sounded pretty good. I sounded pretty good, you know, because I figured it'd be like, nah. but, but but it was, wasn't bad. It was good. It's like, uh, have you ever had the experience like um, – uh, when you see an article of yours or something you wrote or something and you read it later, you go, huh, that's, that's pretty good. <laughs> so yeah. it, it was kind of through it and it not being maybe as perfect as you wanted it, but yeah. the line was there. So you got it out. Yeah. yeah. And you might've been even a little nervous to reread it and you reread it and it's always a great, it doesn't always happen, but it's a great, yeah, yeah, yeah. Say, huh. so it was like that. It was yeah. like that. Um, but anyway, I, you know, I mean, um, Everybody should be um, heartbroken about her passing um, because of the great gift she gave us of, of, you know, changing fundamentally the law. And not just every woman, and not just every woman lawyer either, but even men, you know, to be um, sentenced to a certain way of being because of your gender. Um, and it was her, part of her strategy originally when she was with the ACLU bringing these cases that she brought cases on behalf of men. There was one particular case where um, in, uh, you know, to, to get certain benefits if a spouse died, if the man died, the woman was assumed to be, uh, you know, dependent upon him and got the benefits automatically. But if the woman died, the man had to prove that he was dependent upon her. So that double standard made it difficult for this man, you know, and they had children who were uh, 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 left. And so she brought that case and she brought other cases like that. And she continually emphasized with respect to women, you know, this idea that, oh, but you have this benefit and that benefit and you're treated this way better. The idea is that, you know what, uh, you're put on this pedestal, which is actually a cage. And it was that way for men and women. And so what she did, she 
blew that apart. And a person is an individual. And if you have the capacity and the desire to go to the Virginia Military Institute, you know, and you're a woman and you can, you know, meet the requirements there, you want to be able to go. If you can meet the requirements to become a firefighter, you want to be able to be a firefighter. And it doesn't matter male, female. Now, there are di physical differences between men and women, of course, hallelujah. But um, the fact of the matter is your life prospects shouldn't be dictated by your gender. And that simple message was one that she uh, was able to uh, uh, put out and then carry through at the highest levels of, of the law, constitutionally speaking. I, it's just incredible, really. And it's also interesting to think that, I mean, to make an analogy, like, a, you know, a military, there's the strength of your army, but there's the tactics you use. And a mm -hmm. full assault might not always be the smartest way of attacking something you're against. And it seems like that was what she did, is she realized she could have got all the righteousness and been right on the point and just nailed it straight in and fought right. directly for women. But by using that kind of end around approach, by bringing up the ridiculousness of the angle, the impact on men, then you're just left. Once you acknowledge that, the, the rest. Just right, and you could almost feel light bulbs going on, you know, in the heads of the justices when she was arguing these cases. Um, and you're right. A full frontal assault isn't always the best. And sometimes it could be the worst. And so she, her strategy was very effective. And uh, case after case after case, she built this edifice uh, that allowed us to, to, to be equal. So. Um, now, the question uh, that I had, speaking of whether or not a full frontal assault makes sense, is there is this conversation that's got to be interesting as a, as a con law a professor of court packing. And there's a lot of constitutional analysis going on. Where, uh, and I realize this is sort of a new topic, um, but where, where, where are you? Or what light can you shine on the debate, at least, given your uh, knowledge of the Constitution? Well, uh, his, historically, it was tried by, you know, uh, Franklin Delano Roosevelt and ended very badly. But I'll just say this about the numbers on the court. It's never been always nine. It's been five. It's been seven. Once they had a tie you know, situation. Um, it's not always been nine. Congress can set the numbers. They could make it a thousand, I suppose, if they wanted to be really absurd. But in the face of what's going on, it will be perceived, and it probably will be, uh, just like with uh, President Roosevelt. It's too raw an attempt to override what the what the court is doing, you know, by, by Congress. Um, I don't like the fact that Justice Ginsburg, it appears that she will be replaced by someone who's almost her complete opposite, you know, in terms of uh, ideology and how they how they look at things on the court. And, and is a relatively young woman, I think 48 years old, so she'll be there for years. So for years, the court will be potentially in, in the grasp of people who are quite conservative and have views about the Constitution that uh, I don't share. But to react to that, to respond to that by packing the court, seems like it's the, other, the flip side of the raw political game that the Republicans are playing uh, and it just, it doesn't sit well with me. It doesn't seem principled. It doesn't seem right. So. Now, now here's a, a question that I, the, the constitutional question I have. Mm -hmm. The president nominates and the Senate is supposed confirm. to, you know, right. confirm. Right. My question is, did they, clearly they do, but I'm thinking back to Merrick Garland. Can they pass on their right to approve like what what confuses me about that is that there was never a hearing there was never a vote um i'm guessing that's because mitch mcconnell thought that he might lose some more liberal republicans and that if it came to a vote and people actually met garland and heard about his background he might actually get approved so let's not have a hearing but does the Constitution allow the Senate to say, ooh, we have this right to sign off on a nominee, but we're just going to pass. We're not going to schedule it 
and it's going to expire. Um, it doesn't speak to it, I suppose, if it were done over and over and over again, because the Constitution does say under Article 3 that there shall be a Supreme Court. And what if we got down to nobody? Then obviously that would be unconstitutional. But the Senate does not have to act on a nomination. And in the past, there have been nominations that have never gotten off the ground either. Indeed, the whole thing about what the Senate does has changed over time. Um, there's a story about Justice Douglas when he was nominated and the Senate was going to have a hearing of some kind, or, or at least the, the Judiciary Committee was going to meet about his nomination. He went over to the Senate and sat outside the the room where they were meeting saying, you know, I'm here. If you have any questions for me, and they said, no, nah, <laughs> so that, that there was, there wasn't, it wasn't always this, uh, um, huge deal. Uh, but I think things changed rather radically after, um, uh, judge Bork, uh, was not approved. And there's even a verb that you're borked. Uh, it used to be that if you were, uh, qualified in the sense of your education, uh, you know, you, you weren't, um, you know, uh, an embezzler or something like that. If you were qualified by experience and training, we didn't really get into the ideology very much. And because the, it was always thought that the president should have uh, the latitude, the discretion to name who he or she would like. And then if that person was unqualified, then you would reject it. Or, you know, there, and there were some who were pretty unqualified, you know, just out of the gate and they never, they never got a hearing. They, they were just quietly shelved. So that wouldn't be, that, that wasn't a first. What was a first is this situation that we have now in the face of many, many months before the presidential election, the Republicans, we now know hypocritically, <laughs> said, no, 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 it's much too close. We have to await the results of the election. That was their rationale. But now it's three weeks before the election. And uh, suddenly that interest that they have is seemed to have evaporated. Yeah. It just seems like a reasonable appeal, stopping short of the court packing, would be to simply say, if the president nominates, the Senate must hold a vote, must hold hearings, must hold a vote, mm -hmm. and to pick a time that would apply to nominees of both parties. I mean, I realize the law could always be changed, but in principle, pick a date, and if you know a vacancy occurs after X date, it gets filled afterwards. And of course, well, that we could create we could create wants. a system. Congress could create a system for itself, which it could then always change. But Congress could create a, you know a more orderly, sensible system. But you know. Um, I think that uh, I think it was Biden who said this is just raw political power that we're observing. That that's all that it is. Um, and and uh, Kamala Harris, uh, I saw her quoted. She said, "You know, this is not the president's justice. It's your justice. This is not the president's, you know, uh, um, choice. It should be your choice. It should reflect your choice." And if you have the votes and you can push it through and that's what your intention is, there's nothing in the Constitution from stopping that. Uh, well, from uh, constitutional law to landlord-tenant law. Ah, yes. Let's transition one more time okay. uh, to the, the last uh, newsletter that we put out in terms of the council's activity was a unanimous passage of an um, sort of omnibus eviction reform, tenant protection reform measure, uh, of which you were a co-sponsor, I mean, the sponsor. Um, and uh, so I just wanted to get quickly, I know it has a bunch of terms because I had to write the newsletter article about it, uh, but if you could quickly kind of summarize the, the broader intent, maybe mention a couple of the points of the protections put into place and why you think it's so important. Okay, well, first of all, evictions are, are devastating uh, to tenants, De absolutely devastating. But beyond that, even just having an eviction filed against you can be devastating. And relatively few of the filings result in a judgment for the landlord for an actual eviction, though, though there are many. And the consequence of even having the filing is that you may not be able to rent another apartment, or if you 
if you do, you'll have to pay more, uh, you know, for your uh, security deposit or more rent or something like that. It, it's it's really um, devastating. And so I put in a legislation even before COVID, okay, uh, saying that judges who right now, until we pass this legislation, don't even have the authority to seal eviction records so that just a filing against you, and the landlord doesn't prevail, that stays on the books and that can be used against you. And, and landlords have been using it. So I wanted something to act against that. And so the, the part of the law, part of the law talks about that. And it gives uh, judges the discretion uh, to seal evictions under certain circumstances, but it requires that they seal evictions even when they've been obtained after three years. Because if after three years, you haven't had any trouble paying your rent thereafter, then just like people in bankruptcy, you should get a fresh start. You should have a chance to reset. So that part of it was already in the hopper. And I've been waiting, you know, to have it moved because it's not in my committee. So you have to rely on the, the f help of your friends on the council to move your legislation. And then while it was going forward, uh, Chairman Mendelssohn, he said, well, Let's, make, let's broaden things. Let's also talk about how people get apartments in the first place. Let's talk about you know, screening of tenants uh, by requiring that landlords tell you what the, what the basis is on which they'll rent to you, uh, that they'll tell you why they didn't rent to you. And you would have a chance you know, to basically say, oh, you, know, uh, you said this and that, but that, actually that's not so, you know, to clarify. And you can, you can rely on um, credit reports, but you can't rely solely on, the legislation says, your credit score. Because some people might have a low credit score, but nevertheless be an okay credit risk. So you can't rely solely on that. Let's say a returning citizen, for example, you've been in jail for 10 years, what kind of credit score might you have? Um, but in any case, so we married the two things together both uh, protections for tenants in getting an apartment and protections in terms of misuse of eviction filings. And then right on the mo practically at the moment we were going forward with this, a series of articles came out about process servers who serve eviction notices. And uh, it was shown that these things are just lies often. Filings with, oh yeah, we gave notice to the person that we were seeking an eviction. Yeah, sure we did. No, you didn't. And so now we tacked on, on an emergency basis. More, more has to be looked at here because it's a bigger, broader problem than we had thought. On an emergency basis, the process server has to take a picture and have a date and time stamp of when they uh, serve this notice because apparently they might as well have just been throwing them in a dumpster and setting them on fire and saying to the court, yes, so oh, yeah, we definitely, definitely uh, posted this uh, for, the, uh, for the individual. So it has, I would just say, to simplify it, these three parts. Right. Protections for tenants, you know, in terms of uh, eviction filings, protections for tenants in terms of being able to uh, be screened and have a chance to present, you know, whatever it is you're screening for. And then this idea about uh, holding these uh, process servers to, mm, let me see, the truth. <laughs> uh, so that, that, that's the legislation in its broad outlines. Well, it just, I'm particularly on that last point, it's just remarkable that, that, you know, these days with COVID, with more and more getting delivered to the home, groceries, food, right. whatever it is, you get texted to you the second they leave something on your doorstep and you're like, look, there are the bags that I know that's my welcome mat. And the fact that I can do that with groceries, but something that controls your future, where you live, if you have a residence, your financial future was just, oh, take my word for it. That yeah. put it there. I mean, it's just sort of breathtaking. And um, by the way, to give you some uh, notion about the dimensions here. Since January of this year, like what are we in the tenth month? Uh, there are already like eight thousand eviction filings. Eight thousand. 
Now, we have prevented people from being evicted. Uh, we didn't do it in the first emergency, but somewhere along the way. Um, but we didn't prevent filings. Once we realized that that was a problem, then we prevented that. But uh, the law that we put in for tenants under these adverse circumstances says that you can't be evicted. And um, when the time comes, you know, to when the emergency is over, the landlord has to give you a chance by payments, a payment plan to make up for any arrearages so that it doesn't all automatically immediately come due. And your inability to pay has to be related to the COVID crisis. In other words, it just can't be that, eh, I'm not gonna pay for the duration of the public health emergency. It has to be tied, let's say you lost your job, the obvious uh, case of that. But if so, then there are some people who will probably be building up arrearages and they have to have an opportunity to make it up in installment payments instead of all at once. So let's say your rent is a thousand a month and you owe 10,000, you should maybe so you'll pay. I'm already out of my mathematical uh, calculations here, but you know, periodic payments, just like you do on a, like a credit card. Does anyone, I don't know if it's the CFO, I don't know who it would be, but does anyone have a sense of what percent of people are not paying because they can't pay, which I assume is the largest group. What percent of people are not paying and will pay the day it comes due, they'll pay all their back rent because they won't have access to a payment plan, like you said. Right. Uh, and how many people are paying their rent as they normally would? There probably are some figures. Uh, I don't know what they are. Um, I think I'm most, mo most people, are, well, I'm sorry? I, I'm not convinced there are numbers. I haven't seen any in the press. I'm just... Well, they, they, they would extrapolate uh, from uh, the number of unemployment claims, the number of renters, and they, they could put different data bases together, I think, to make, you know, a ballpark judgment. But I think that most people, given the unemployment rate, most people are still in a position to be able to keep up with their uh, rents. And until Congress refuse to go forward with another uh, uh, piece of legislation to help people out. When we were paying $400 in unemployment per week and the federal government was paying $600, that's $1,000 a week that people were getting. And that, that was for some months. So that uh, was probably able to get most people where they needed to be. So I don't know, but I, I don't think that the numbers are going to be um, extraordinary. You hear claims that they're gonna be extraordinary. But when I think about the unemployment rate, and, and that's even putting aside who got unemployment uh, of, of a sufficient amount, um, I, I'm not sure that, I don't know. I don't think that the numbers, the numbers are gonna be significant and we should never be calm about the fact that a lot of people may face a great difficulty when the public health emergency is over, but I don't think it's going to be the, uh, as great a disaster as some are portraying it. Um, and here again, it may be possible, I don't know, but uh, maybe Congress can get itself together again to provide relief, you know, to various jurisdictions so that we can be prepared, you know, with um, rental help and uh, things of that nature. In addition to which, I'm so happy that over the years, we've had a responsible council and mayor that we've built up our reserves and not spent them like there are some candidates in the, in the current race, you know, for, for council at large who, you know, they would spend down our reserves. It's a good thing we didn't because that's why we have a AAA bond rating. That's why we can go uh, and borrow from ourselves short term when we need to instead of going to, to the markets, but it's also, we call it a rainy day fund for a reason, one of them, uh, because you get rainy days. And so um, when the time comes that the public health emergency is lifted, we'll have to see what the need is and we'll have to see what kind of resources we can um, gather to help people. There will be people who need help for sure. Um, and maybe Congress will have behaved responsibly by then, I'm hoping. 
where a, a final question because we're running out of time but where does all this leave landlords i, I think that the tenants I, it passed the unanimous council all the the tenant right. protection forms but at the end of the day there's rent that's not being paid to people that may owe on mortgages uh what is being done on the landlord side of the equation? Well, that's a very, very fair question. In terms of the mortgages, we also stayed any action by uh, banks with respect to mortgages, uh, you know, for also for hardship. So, uh, you know, there are a lot of uh, people who have uh, four unit apartments or, or smaller uh, apartments, you know, who uh, depend on this for their income and depend upon it for the payment of their mortgage. So. They're being held harmless, at least for the moment, but we have to true up here somewhere because the landlords, everybody is not a big, you know, um, absentee, large corporation. There are many, many people who, who depend upon this uh, for their income. And uh, the benefits of what we're able to do have to accrue to them as well. So yes, it's a very good question. We'll have to see, you know, what what the ultimate need is. Okay, I'm quickly just gonna pop onto uh, Facebook and see if anyone has posted any uh, questions there. Yeah, because you can't say this is over. I'm having so much fun, aren't you? I know that the challenge, the podcast can go on forever. The challenge is the radio show is 30 minutes oh. okay. and you have a full schedule booked. So um, generally what we do is we post two different versions. Um, a shorter version for the radio and then a longer version. Um, but I am trying to quickly see if there are any comments um, or questions that have been posted here. Um, and I see one and I already asked it. So um, anyway, that is uh, all the time we have, unfortunately, although you're welcome back. Uh, we can do these. It's much easier now that you're at home and I'm at home. It's kind of weird, but it, it does take away uh, travel time and some of the logistics. So, um, but anyway, thank you very much uh, for being generous with your time and joining us. And uh, listeners, thank you very much. Uh, please be sure I mentioned the podcast to subscribe uh, anywhere you subscribe to podcasts. That's where you'll find us. Um, and uh, tune in again next time. We're at DC Radio at 96.3 on your HD4 dial or at dcradio.gov. And just the usual reminder, I'm Josh Gibson. This is not a council hearing. This is here in council. Thank you, Council Member Che. Take care. Be Thank safe. You, Josh. Thanks. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye, -bye. In D.C., for D.C., D.C. Radio, 96.3 HD4 and dcradio.gov.